Welcome to One Haas, a podcast devoted to bringing the Haas community closer together through your stories. I'm your host, Sean Lee, and my mission is to help open our eyes to the network we never knew we had. So today I'm joined by Epa Rixie of the EW 2019 program. How are you doing today? Doing well. Um, about to go to class. <laughs> yeah, we're about to start a nine hour day. Yeah. Of classes on Saturday. However, you're on electives now. Yeah, it gets a little shorter. Okay. So you're done at what? One? Four o'clock. Oh. Yeah. So I do two classes. So I do nine to noon and then one to four. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, What classes are you taking this semester? Uh, Financial information analysis and asset management. So I did engineering for undergrad. So Uh I really wanted to go heavy on finance for the MBA program. So Mm -hmm. I've just been clicking away at all the good finance electives. So tell me about your, your past. Let's, let's start off with your undergrad. Uh, you went to Vanderbilt and yep. said you went for engineering. Yep. How did you get into consulting after college? Yeah, so when I went to Vanderbilt, I think I envisioned myself doing a traditional engineering job. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to work in defense contract engineering or space engineering, aeronautical, something really technical. Huh. So I did mechanical engineering and then... I also had a minor in human and organizational development, which is kind of the interdisciplinary business and education major Mm -hmm. at Vanderbilt. I did an internship after my freshman year for a sensors and analysis company that basically looked at like vibration patterns of engine systems. Uh And it was fine. You know, I mean, I could do the work, I could crunch the numbers, but it wasn't engaging. And it also, I think, highlighted to me that if you go down that traditional engineering path, you end up doing the same job for a long time Mm. before you really get to break out and look at larger problems and synthesize insights across, you know, many different departments or projects or ideas. You end up on very, very specific niche projects. And Mm. so that led me to kind of moving away from engineering. Mm -hmm. And at that point I was a little lost. I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, what's my next step? (laughs) Right. And Vanderbilt had a summer business program called Accelerator that was basically an immersion MBA mini, if you will, Uh, like a hundred hours of MBA classroom education paired with six or seven real time client engagements. So they bring in companies. It's kind of like the apprentice, although that has a negative connotation. (laughs) But you know, I mean, you're doing these like, like mini internships. Um, Okay. And the companies were interesting. I mean, it was everything from like Sony Music Nashville to a company that makes slot machines to a hospital to a vineyard tackling strategic or operational challenges for those companies and making proposals, Mm -hmm. which is basically consulting. Yeah, yeah, And so it hooked me on the idea of being a consultant. And so after the summer of my sophomore year, I was really hell-bent on getting an internship for one of the big three consulting firms. Mm -hmm. Ended up getting offers from BCG and Bain. Wow. And picked Bain mostly on the premise of culture. Mm -hmm. So my BCG offer was San Francisco, which I probably would have enjoyed more (laughs) geographically. Uh, My Bain offer was for Dallas, Dallas, which I had no real affiliation with. But I really, really enjoyed the firm mentality of Bain. And I hesitate to say shoot from the hip, but really answer first and results oriented Mm -hmm. nature of the company, right? Mm -hmm. We're not going to study a problem to death. We're going to try and create actionable insight. Mm. That mentality really appealed to me. Also, thought it was interesting that the founders of both BCG and Bain were Vandy alums. Mm. (laughs) So there was like a funny common thread there. Anyway, so I I did management consulting and I loved it. It was Mm -hmm. great. I really enjoyed it. I loved bouncing around on different projects and always being exposed to new ideas and being challenged to learn business concepts on the fly. Having done my undergrad in engineering, I hadn't had a lot of exposure to accounting and finance and economics. Right. And so learning those in a practical sense was great. I right. mean, I would say management consulting out of undergrad is essentially like a next step in your education, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You're, they have excellent training programs. They're going to run you through the ringer. But then one of the most valuable things is getting to see under the hood of these different companies, right? Mm-hmm. You're dealing with massive Fortune 100 companies. I mean, I worked for one of the largest computer manufacturers in the world, one of the largest airlines in the world, one of the largest breweries in the world. Mm-hmm. And you guys see how those companies are set up and how their org structure works yeah. and what their reporting's like and how their management team interfaces with their employees which is, I think, one of the learnings that nobody really talks about with right. management consulting, right. is that you get to be a fly on the wall in all these different companies. Yeah. So I loved it. I wasn't really actively looking to leave, but mm-hmm. at the two-year mark, I was looking at full-time MBA programs, and Bain has a retention tool 
called an externship. It's essentially a six-month leave of absence. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will do it when they're working on business school applications to free up time. So you're not working 60, 70 hours a week. You can pair back to 40. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is two years into consulting. Correct, yeah. And so plenty of people will go and work for a nonprofit. I wanted to work for a brewery. Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, I've been a home brewer for a while and have been really immersed in the craft beer culture of Dallas. At the time, Dallas was going through this big craft brewery boom. I mean, they had essentially zero when I moved there and like four opened up in the first year I lived there. Wait a minute. So you did two years of consulting. You're looking to get into your MBA, Mm -hmm. but then you switched to a brewery. So I was going to do just six months. I was going to do an externship. That was my idea. Like an externship. Yeah. Okay. Externship. Take a six month leave of absence, go explore it, see what it's like, Mm -hmm. see if it's something I maybe want to do after full-time business school. Right. And in the search process, I started cold calling a bunch of people and, through a Bain alum from San Francisco, I was able to network my way to the COO of Lagunitas. Uh-huh. And when we opt on the phone, we just hit it off. Right. A great chat. I think he and I are cut from the same cloth and you know have similar mentalities. And as a result, he was like, you should interview. Like, mm-hmm. let's let's explore this thing. What he didn't tell me is he set up interviews with the founder of Lagunitas, this guy Tony <laughs> McGee, and Leon, our CFO. Yeah. But he told him he was trying to get me for a full-time job. Right. And I'm still going into this thinking about an externship. And yeah. so we're going through these interviews. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll come for six months. And they're like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> um, but I think they was this, uh, the interview still went well. I think they were impressed. And uh, they extended me an offer. And so I, I ended up in this kind of tough position. I had a full-time offer from Lagunitas, mm-hmm. which was kind of my dream job, like working in strategic planning for this growth company that was poised to explode in the craft beer space. But I really wanted to get my MBA and Mm -hmm. go do full-time, you know, and it was also Bain would pay for a full-time MBA. So there's a big value proposition you're giving up there. Yeah. And I was really impressed. Bain had an awesome attitude about it. They were like, just treat it as an externship. Go. If you hate it, quit after six months and come back. Yeah. Which is really mature attitude, I think, for a company. I think the consultancies in general know they're in a high turnover business, mm-hmm. and so they need to try and appeal to employees. Well, from what I heard, it is like an extended MBA, uh, yeah. even for consultants coming out of MBAs, because there is this supportive culture where they, I heard they have alums, right? Yep. And they have alum events. Yep. And, uh, and they even help you find jobs elsewhere. Here. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a great support network there. And like I said, I really liked the job. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think the only thing about consulting that, kind of wore me down a little bit was the fact that you're not producing anything physical. As an engineer, you know, I really like tangible things. Like that was that was part of why I really enjoyed Vanderbilt, because they had a machine shop and you could learn how to weld and make things and you know see the results of your efforts. Yeah. And consulting, you're always making recommendations. You're making PowerPoint decks and Excel documents and they don't always translate into action. Right. Right. You may make the best recommendation in the world. But you know, I was on one in what they call an enduring client relationship, which is where you know the Bain's been there for five years on just constant rotation of cases. Right, uh, and I became kind of one of the experts on a particular subsegment of the work we were doing there, and so I was there for fourteen months, which is very atypical. I see. Like normally, they try and rotate you every three months, mm-hmm. and so I saw multiple projects that I worked on close, we made the recommendation, but then they didn't get implemented. Mm. And like, that's fine. I mean, they're paying us, so we (laughs) build our, you know, our service, but there's an intrinsic motivation part that that fails to satisfy, right? Like, you're like, I know that would have made a difference. And I know you guys could have really done a lot with that. Right. That was actually why I got into homebrewing in the first place was Mm -hmm. like, I needed to make something. Like I needed to like see the fruits of my effort. And if I'd had a garage, maybe it would have been woodworking or like machining, but I was in a small apartment in Dallas. And so it was homebrewing. That's funny. (laughs) Anyway, that was another thing when I was like thinking about making this leap, I really liked the idea of owning projects, right? And being able to execute and see things through to fruition and be the guy in the driver's seat versus mm-hmm. the guy talking in his ear. Having gotten that strategic planning role at uh, Lagunitas, what brought you to Haas for your MBA? Yeah, so I am probably in a very small camp of people getting an MBA in that I think most people get an MBA for three reasons, right? Mm-hmm. You're either switching jobs, yeah. you're building your network, mm-hmm. or you're learning. Correct. And Usually, the order is the one I gave, mm-hmm. right? You want to switch jobs and building a network will help yeah. you do that and the learning comes tertiary. 
for me, the learning was first. Hmm. Like I, I like my job. I'm not really looking to switch it in the near term. Mm -hmm. I have a decent network through Bain and through my undergrad and um, I'm heavily involved in the alumni association for my alma mater. Mm -hmm. But the learning piece was the real thing I was missing. Like I really wanted to study business in an academic sense mm -hmm. more so than learning it on the job. There's, there's so much you can learn on the job, but I really wanted to sit down and take a microeconomics course or a macroeconomics course and learn those disciplines and learn a way of thinking a little more rigorously about business mm. and finance. Are you looking to advance in your existing position? Or? Yeah, I think, I think it certainly will. I mean, <laughs> having an MBA is not going to hurt me mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of career advancement, but... For me, it was really more about satisfying a personal need and a personal itch to learn. I, I thrive in an academic classroom environment. I really enjoy it. I'd been looking forward to getting an MBA full time. Mm -hmm. And so the EW program was the perfect mix. I was able to keep a job that I really, really liked yeah. and enjoyed while also developing and learning on the side. Well, let me ask you this, just to rephrase the question differently. What are you looking to do after us? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's still a little bit wide open. You know, I'm open to opportunities staying at Lagunitas. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been acquired by Heineken, mm -hmm. which I don't know if you knew that. We did a 50 50 joint venture with them that I worked on back in 2015. And then they bought the other half of the company back in May of oh, last wow. year. So there's going to be opportunity there. I still don't know exactly what that looks like or if I'm going to want to partake, but. I'd be foolish not to consider it. Right, right. Another idea that I've been kicking around, and this is not fully formed, but I've really enjoyed economics. Hmm. And I think there's a very interesting element to how craft beer and more broadly local business models have had this massive resurgence and what the economic underpinnings of that are. Hmm. And so one idea I've been kicking around of is doing continuing education focused on applied economics and particularly probably a PhD focused on industrial organization and behavioral economics and what the underpinnings are of this kind of local small business movement. Mm -hmm. And when you look at an uh, industry that has 5,000 small firms that are all locally rooted like craft beer does mm -hmm. versus the large multinational conglomerate side of the equation, you know, per dollar of spending, like which one has a better economic output for society? Mm. And I think there are interesting arguments to be made on both sides, right? Yeah. The large company uses less resources. It has efficiencies in terms of shipping and distribution. It's able to better manage its resource footprint. And it's better able to make big long-term investments like going 100% renewable, which is something Anheuser-Busch and Heineken have both committed to in, in the long term. Mm -hmm. But then the small business model is, is you know totally different, right? It's about community development and going in and rehabilitating blighted neighborhoods and in a sense, their inefficiencies possibly add up to an efficient market. Yeah, And so I think that'd be a really interesting thing to study. I'm still playing around with the idea and what that would look like and when I would do it. Uh -huh. But I think that's an interest area that I didn't have prior to coming to Berkeley uh -huh. that's really blossomed through some great academic professors and classroom discussions. It's, it's interesting to bring this up because we're, we're just starting up ethics today. Yep. And we had this buttload of reading for ethics and just reading that Milton Friedman. Who's your professor? Piece. Is it Del uh, Bo? Del Bo, yeah. He's amazing. I really, really enjoyed that class. And just reading that piece, I was, I was feeling the ops. I was, I've, ever since micro, actually, um, I, I've, I've felt this tension. Because I've taken micro before. I, I studied finance uh, from my undergrad. And I was just like, you know, what is this thing about you know, profit maximization? right? And then and our article today was, the social responsibility of business is to increase profits, right? Yep. And having been in business for the past 10 years and seeing how some businesses make an impact in their community and some don't, I'm just, it just really made me rethink that. I'm like, well, what is this idea of profit maximization, yep. right? Is it to increase profits or is it to increase profitability? Yeah. Because, you know, that small little change does make a huge difference in the business world. Well, and your, your frame of reference, right? Mm -hmm. Are you looking at profits for shareholders? Mm -hmm. That's one definition. And who are your shareholders? And who are your shareholders? Or are you looking at profits for stakeholders, which mm -hmm. could be the community, it could be broader. 
I mean, I look at Lagunitas. Lagunitas is a great company. Like I've really enjoyed working there. And a lot of the reason I have some of these ideas and interests and curiosities thrives from uh, having spent time working for a company that's really, really heavily involved in the community. Mm -hmm. Our original marketing program was nothing more than donating beer to nonprofits. Because wow. early on, Tony had this keen insight of like, I don't really have the money to pay to do advertising or promotion, mm -hmm. but I make beer for this amount of money mm -hmm. and the public values it at this amount and I can give it away to nonprofits and make that spread. Mm. And so ever since the beginning, you know, we've been able to donate a bunch of beer to nonprofits. I mean, we donate millions of dollars to nonprofits. Our tap rooms open on, on Mondays and Tuesdays exclusively for nonprofits. We donate the beer, the space, and the staff for them to do fundraisers. And so there's these really cool community-centric business models that have emerged mm -hmm. that have all these positive externalities while creating profits for shareholders, but, mm -hmm. but there's a broader sense of purpose. And so I think it's interesting to look at these business models and challenge some of those questions, right? Yeah. So do corporations exist to maximize shareholder value mm -hmm. or is there a broader set of metrics that should be used? Mm -hmm. And I think California is a perfect place to start asking those questions. And Berkeley specifically, it meshes a lot of that type of questioning into the curriculum. That makes sense, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's uh, let's wrap this up. I have uh, one burning question is, uh, what is your favorite beer at Lagunitas? Ooh, tough, tough question. <laughs> it's very difficult to pick just one. Um, all right, top three. Top three. That's good, because <laughs> I, I could go all day. Uh, top three would be, so we have this one, Born Yesterday, mm -hmm. that was a, a project I worked on starting back in 2014. It's a wet hopped beer. And so what that means is we take hops that have not been kilned, they're just picked straight off of the vine in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're still wet and full of flavor and juicy. And we throw those into a beer. You okay. can only make it one time a year during harvest. And it's just an exceptionally good IPA. Wow. I mean, I think we call it a pale ale, but it's like seven and a half percent. So let's, who are we kidding? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a great one. Another really fun beer that we make that's coming out here soon is called Waldo's Special Ale. And so that gets made every year for 420. And it's a tribute to the original group of guys who went by the nickname the Waldos who coined the term 420. Mm -hmm. They were students at San Rafael High School in Central Marin. And I've heard of this, yeah. Yeah, it's a fun, fun story. And so anyway, we partnered with them and made this like just dank hop monster of a beer that's at like 10%. Wow. Um, so that's coming out soon and is a really, really fun beer. And then my last one would probably be uh, we've done a couple different bourbon barrel aged stouts. So mm -hmm. one of my projects early on at Lagunitas was launching at scale our limited release beer program. Mm -hmm. And that program has evolved into what we call the one hitter series now. They're different limited release beers. Both of the beers I mentioned fall in that program, Waldo's Special Ale and Born Yesterday. But the first beer that we really created for that program and that has lived on was called High Westified Imperial Coffee Stout. And so we took High West bourbon barrels and we put our Imperial Stout with coffee added to it and aged it for a series of different ages and then did a blending to get to the right flavor profile. And it's this just decadent, delicious, big, boozy imperial stout. Subsequently, Constellation, one of our competitors that owns Ballast Point, mm -hmm. has acquired High West. And so we got a polite cease and desist letter. <laughs> And we pivoted to using Willet bourbon barrels from Kentucky. Okay. But it's a similarly just awesome beer. The two have different notes. You know, the High West was more of a rye whiskey, really spicy in your mm. face. Uh, the Willet's more, you know, sweet and bourbon-y, but like, it's just a great beer. All right. Well, definitely going to go try all three. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for tuning in today. My aim is to bring the Haas community closer together through your stories. We're always looking for Hossies willing to share their stories and experiences so that we can give you more insights into the different programs, different careers, and ultimately different perspectives. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please feel free to email me for suggestions on how I can improve this podcast, or if you have any recommendations on people or content you'd like to hear. My email is reachshawn at berkeley.edu. That's spelled R-E-A-C-H-S-E-A-N at berkeley.edu. 